preacher, John chapter number 20, in your Bible tonight. You glad to be saved? Say amen. amen. Praise the Lord, Brother Tommy. What a great message. Appreciate Brother Tommy. He gets with it, man. And uh, praise God, it's wonderful. Uh, we were down in Florida together just a couple of days ago, and he preached the sunshine away. It's been raining ever since you left. And uh, he preached great. Uh, Brother Tommy and I were together in a large meeting. There's about 3,000 people there. And me and him were all in one shouting. The rest of them, we like scared them to death. But he was the only white person among about 3,000. He looked over me. He said, I felt like a fly in a bowl of milk. <laughs> oh, Then I went to his church and preached, and I was the only white man there. And I told him I was the cream inside of an Oreo cookie, praise God. <laughs> and when, when you get me and still together, you got fudge ripple, praise God. <laughs> oh, my. And what a blessing. What a blessing. And praise God, I'm glad we're under the blood tonight. Good to be back at Gateway. And I hate I didn't get here the first part of the week. My favorite preacher was here, Brother Brian McBride. What a preacher. In my humble opinion, he's the preachingest man right now in shoe leather. And I appreciate Brother Brian. And I hate I got to miss him, but I've heard all of his sermons before, so I didn't miss much, I'm sure. But uh, praise the Lord for him. And it's good to be with this saint of God. I appreciate the uh, Brother Stewart. And uh, every time I look over at him, I see my dad sitting over there. Uh, him and my dad were good friends. They pastored in the same area for several years. And since I was here last year, uh, my dad checked out and uh, went in the glory. And I appreciate a love offering this church sent. And I used it to pay part of dad's monument. We got him a big old monument. I mean one of them big ones. And it's got his name, and up under it, it says, Daddy Preached. And on the side where my mama was going to lay, we got under there, Mama Prayed. Because I want people to go by there to know their last two saints of God that put their investments. And I'm glad, praise God, heaven sounding sweeter all the time. And somebody asked Talbot Moore a while back, they said, Dr. Moore, do you really believe People sang and shout in heaven. He said, I don't know, but a whole lot of them left here doing it. And thank God I believe they're in, they're in overtime. Praise God. What a blessing tonight. John chapter number 20. And to save time, we'll read just a couple of verses. And to get a thought tonight that God has laid upon our heart. But we're going to use the entire chapter as our text. John chapter 19, John chapter 20 and verse number 19. John 20, verse 19, the Bible says, The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace. Be unto you. And aren't you glad tonight? He is the peace speaker. He is the one that can calm the troubled waters of your soul. Look in verse number 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Just his hands and his side. And here is our text tonight. Then were the disciples glad when they saw each other. Then the disciples were glad uh, when they saw the government. Then the disciples were glad when they saw their check. When they saw their portfolio. When they saw the retirement plan. The disciples were glad... When they saw the Lord. John 20, verse 20, they were glad when they saw the Lord. 
I guess that's what you call 2020 vision. Because they saw the Lord, and their faith was renewed, and their gloom was turned into gladness. You say, what did they have in this text to be gloomy about? Well, there the Bible said they're assembled behind closed doors at evening because they had fear of the Jews. They were afraid they were going to be the next one crucified. They did not have complete understanding of the purpose of God. They were treading on unfamiliar territory. They had never been in that direction before. Would you agree with me tonight that the church is in unfamiliar territory? We have never gone this far in the dispensation of grace. And if you're not careful, it will cause gloom to settle in your heart. They were facing some unfriendly foes. They had just watched their leader impaled to a cross. And they felt like they would be next. And they were battling some unfriendly foes. Would you agree with me tonight that we are in the battle of our life. And we're not only on unfamiliar territory, we are in unfriendly territory. The world is against us tonight. I believe the winds of change are blowing, but they're blowing in the wrong direction. I believe a great test is going to come to the body of Christ. And we're going to separate the men from the boys. Because I believe the way this thing is going, there's going to come a time where you're going to have to prove how much you love God. We are facing persecution on every hand. As far as the world is concerned, we're the problem. We're the enemy. We're the ones that's not with the program. But the world has always been in opposition against God. And if you stand for right and stand for God and stand for morality, you'll be in unfriendly territory. And if you get your eyes upon your enemy, I promise you, it will cause gloom to come upon the recesses of your soul. They were in unfamiliar territory. They were facing unfriendly foes. And then they were dealing with unfulfilled dreams. I mean, they thought he was going to restore the kingdom. He is, but not yet. They thought he was going to break the yoke of bondage that the Roman Empire had upon their neck. He did. He was going to, but not then. In other words, their ministries just hadn't turned out like they thought it ought to. Their dreams seemed to be unfilled. And I promise you, if you live long enough, there's going to be some times in your life when things just don't turn out like you think they ought to. There'll be times when your ministry won't turn out like you thought it ought to. There'll be times when your family, when your children won't turn out like you thought it ought to. All of us tonight have to battle unfulfilled dreams. And if we're not careful, it will cause gloom to settle in upon our soul. The gloom of disappointment. The gloom of distraction. The gloom of discouragement. The gloom of of despair. It will settle in. It will steal your shout. It will steal your joy. It will rob you of your fire. But the Bible has sent the disciples on the back side of the closed doors, in the darkest hour of their life, their gloom got turned to gladness by one visit from the resurrected Christ. May I remind you tonight, He is the living Christ. He is the resurrected Christ. And even though I'm in unfamiliar territory, and I face unfriendly foes, and I deal with unfulfilled dreams. 
He's still God. He's still real. He's still alive. And He's still on the throne. And God can take the gloom and turn it into gladness. There are four things in this text tonight that happens that takes the gloom and turns it to gladness. In verse number 1, the stone was rolled away. The Bible said on the first day of the week that Mary came to the sepulcher. And the Bible said she found that the stone was rolled away. Mary didn't roll away the stone the disciples didn't roll away the stone. I don't even believe the angels rolled away the stone. I believe God Himself, through His sovereign, omnipotent power, rolled the stone away. Time out. Aren't you glad we serve a God that's still in the stone rolling away business? You say, what is so important? How about the stone being rolled away by God Himself? Well, Jesus was not the first one to come back from the domain of the dead. You find that in the Old Testament. The man of God raised the widow woman's son from the domain of the dead. That soldier in that battle fell dead, but he fell on the bones of the old man of God. And he came back from the domain of the dead. In the gospel, Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, brought her back from the domain of the dead. In John 11, he stood up the grave of Lazarus and called him back from the domain of the dead. Jesus was not the first one to come back from the domain of the dead. But he was the first one to come back and the only one to come back by his own authority. And by His own power, Elijah raised up the widow woman's son, and Jesus raised up Lazarus. But God Almighty, Prince Emmanuel, the Almighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, He came back from the domain of the dead by His own power and His own authority and His own strength. He is God, and besides Him, there is none else. They found the stone was rolled away. It's just another one of those rocks in the Bible that if it had something to say, it really would have something to say. You remember when Jesus was coming in that triumphant entry and they were praising Him and singing, Hosanna, blessed is He who cometh in the name of the Lord. And those Pharisees and them Sadducees and all them wet blankets said, Calm them down. Shut them up. Don't let them shout. Jesus stood up and said, Let them rip. Let them go. If they don't praise Me, I'll get the rocks to cry out. I was watching a documentary the other day on these scientists, and they're trying to invent some type of apparatus that can retrieve sound from rocks. They think that rocks has recorded sound. And if they can just invent a scientific apparatus, they can retrieve sound that's been recorded in that rock. And learn a lot about history. Well, I don't know about them, but evidently God's got some kind of apparatus where He can retrieve sounds from rocks. Because He told that crowd, if you don't let them praise me, I'll get the rocks to cry out. I got to think the other day, if the rocks in the Bible could talk, what in the world could they say? Can you imagine that little old stone that was used in that slingshot to kill that giant? Can you imagine this testimony? That stone said, well, I was laying down there in the brook, minding my own business with my four cousins, the stone family. And said, David's hand reached down in that sea, reached down in that stream, picked me up, and then put me in that sling and hurled me around and 
let me go, and I flew through the air like a guided missile, hit that giant right between the God-given eyeballs, and he fell down dead. And David jumped up and took the giant sword and cut the giant's head off. If that stone could speak, I believe he would say, if God be for us, then who can be against us? What about that rock that Moses got hid in that night when he got covered by the hand of God and the glory passed by? Can you imagine what that rock would say? It would say something like this. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Can you imagine this rock in our text that stood up the grave of Jesus three days and three nights and all of a sudden one Easter Sunday morning the earth began to tremble. That's the hand of God from glory. Push that stone and it rolled down to the bottom of the hill. If that stone could speak, I believe it'd say something like this. I know my Redeemer liveth. Now, I don't know what them rocks has got to say, but I do know what I got to say. One day there was a stone of rebellion and a stone of depravity and a stone of rejection across my soul. But I met the resurrection and the life and believed the gospel and called upon the name of the Lord. And He rolled the stone away. And I'm not dead. I'm not a sinner. I'm not lost. But I'm alive in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what to take your gloom and turn it to gladness when the stone is rolled away and God is still in the stone moving business. When the stone was rolled away. Number two, there's something else in this text. When the saints are comforted, it'll take the gloom and turn it to gladness. In John chapter 20, there are three sets of comfort. You have Mary that was weeping. You have the disciples that were worried. And then you have Thomas who was wondering. But they all got comforted when Jesus took their gloom and turned it to gladness. Let's look at Mary. The Bible said when they come to the sepulcher, Peter and John come. But by the time you get down to verse 9 and 10, Peter and John go home. They left church early. They left right at dinner time. But Mary stayed for the afterglow. Mary stayed for the after service. My point is, when you go to church, don't leave till the Lord shows up. And they all had gone home and there's Mary. She's by herself. She was the only one that waited around on Sunday to see if God was going to do anything. And so she's standing there by the tomb, and boy, she's a-weeping. Her nerves is tore up. She wants to know where the Lord is. Well, our text says in John 20, she turned around, and there stood this man. And she thought it was the gardener. Well, not a bad assessment because he does plow and plant and prune and pick his own. He did say, I am the vine and you are the branches and my father is the husbandman. She thinks he's the gardener come to find out he's the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. And she says, hey, sir, if you've taken him away, just tell me where you put him and I'll go get him myself. Well, about that time that stranger in the shadows speaks. And he does not give her a five-hour dissertation on the doctrine of the resurrection. He doesn't give her a seven-point alliterated hominidic and correct outline. On the doctrine of the dispensation. He just said one word. Mary. Mary. That's all it took. When he said Mary, she bowed and said, Reboni, Master, that's really you. 
You say, what's God going to do to take my gloom and turn it to gladness when He calls your name? When He whispers your name? When God comes by and reminds you that He's still God and besides Him there is none else I'm glad tonight He knows our name. He knows our frame. And thank God He still calls us by name. Mary. And son, I believe she tore out of that too. I believe she's a thorn grass and gravel a mile high. And she runs back up there to that upper room where they're assembled. Open the door, boys. I got something to say. I imagine they peeked through the hole and said, Who is that? They thought it might be one of them Roman soldiers. They thought it might be the handcuffs and the chains and maybe one of them rugged crosses. But they said, Who is it? She said, It's Mary. It's me. Mary. Open the door. Come in here, Mary. Calm down, honey. What's a going on? I believe she said, you ain't going to believe it. Thomas, I know you ain't going to believe it. <laughs> believe what? And all she can say is, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. By the way, I just stopped by Bowling Springs, South Carolina to tell some child of God on the other side of your prison bars, on the other side of your depression, on the other side of your disturbance, He's alive! He's alive! He's alive! And He takes the gloom and turns it to gladness. I imagine one of those disciples say, Mary, get a hold of yourself. We know how you women are. You get hysterical about stuff. Calm down. Calm down, Mary. How do you know? It was Him. Mary, how do you know it was the Lord? I believe this would have been a reply. Boys, I was standing there in the shadows. Let me borrow one of your lines. Y'all watch this. I was standing there in the shadows. And I heard him when he called my name. My mama called me Mary. My daddy called me Mary. You guys call me Mary. But ain't nobody ever said Mary like he said Mary. Oh, the Savior knows my name. I'm going to tell you there's a God that stands in the shadows of your problem and your malady and your valley. He still knows your name. He still calls your name. And He can, and He can take your gloom and turn it to gladness. You say, preacher, I came to this meeting tonight depressed and discouraged and distraught. Listen, He's standing on resurrection ground, calling you by name. Hallelujah. He did say in John chapter 10, He calleth His own by name. I'm talking about the one that went to town and went to the very tree that Zacchaeus was up. And He didn't say, Whoever you are, or if there's anybody up there, the price is right. Come on down. No, he went to the very tree. He knew he was up that tree. The hounds of heaven done run him up that tree. And Jesus went to the very tree and said, Zacchaeus, aren't you glad that very church you was in, that very service you was in, the Savior went to that very spot, went to that very church, went to that very service, and called you by name, called you unto himself. God still knows your name. 
same one. Went to the very city. Went to the very cemetery. Went to the very plot. And said, roll away the stone. And he didn't say, anybody in there? Whoever you are, come out with your hands up. No, he went to that place. And he called him by name. Lazarus. I asked my dad one time, I said, Dad, why did he say Lazarus come forth? He said, boy, Jesus was the resurrection and the life. And if he'd have just said come forth, every dead person in the world would have walked out on resurrection ground and did one time for that yet. Lazarus, oh, aren't you glad in that old tomb of unbelief and in that old tomb of total depravity, you live there, you don't die there, you don't went to hell from there? Oh, but praise God, He rolled away the stone and called you by name. And though you were dead, yet shall He live. God still knows your name. Zacchaeus, come down. Lazarus, come out. Mary, come down. Mary. Oh, I've been in some weeping places. I've been in some hard places when my children didn't understand, when my wife did not understand, when my friends did not understand. And I felt like nobody cared if I lived or if I died. But before the devil could push me over the edge of total despair, I, mm, hallelujah, I heard a sweet voice. And it wasn't a strange voice. It wasn't the roar of the lion. It wasn't the howling of the wolf. It was not the barking of the dogs of Bashan. But it was that familiar, peace-speaking, doubt-settling, smoke-clearing, heaven-coming down voice from another country. It is I. It is I. I'm telling you tonight, listen. He's calling your name. He knows your need. And God can take the gloom and turn it to gladness. Mary called her by name. And said, go tell my disciples. I'll meet them in a little while. A week later, next Sunday, two Sunday mornings in a row, God showed up for church. Our text. They're behind closed doors. And for the fear of the Jews, then came Jesus. Mm. Most of the time when you want to go to somebody's house, you'll knock on the door. You don't have to, buddy, when you are the door. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to really bother you real holy separated people. You people that's got more convictions than God. You that are against stuff God does. You ain't going to like this. But I like making you not like stuff. They give you something to talk about me on the Internet. Huh. They, were not, they were not up there praying. They were not up there having a camp meeting. They were not up there having a fasting and a praying session. They hadn't asked Him to come. They hadn't even thought about Him coming. They didn't deserve for Him to come. But bless God, cause He wanted to. Whoop! Uninvited and unexpected and undeserving. He just came. He didn't wait for an invitation. Didn't even ask for one. He didn't ring the bell nor even knock on the door. Just walked in. Interrupted their gloom. They were not up there singing Amazing Grace. They were up there having a jubilee. They're in that room going, What happened? I don't understand it. Things were going so good. 
It looked like we was moving places. Now look, he's dead. They're after us. It ain't supposed to be like this. We just give up the last three and a half years of our life. We separated. We've been standing. We took our stand. It ain't supposed to be like this. I don't understand this. I don't like this. This ain't fair. And God, uninvited, unexpected, un- Lord, have mercy, undeserving, stepped in. Oh, don't you like it? I said, don't you like it? I s- Amen. Hey, I like to pray when the glory comes down. But I like for it to come down when I ain't even pray. You say, don't God bless living right? Yeah, boy. Don't God judge living wrong? Yeah, boy. But sometimes when I ain't live right, and sometimes when I have live wrong, ain't read Ain't prayed, ain't wanted to. Felt four thousand miles from God, four thousand miles from the anointing of the Holy Ghost, wore out, mad, aggravated, frustrated, but unexpected. And uninvited. Woo! And definitely undeserving. Same Jesus. Walked into my room. <laughs> Walked into my gloom. Hey! If God only came when we deserved it, He wouldn't come much. When God only showed up when we deserved it, He wouldn't show up much. But it ain't riding on me. It ain't riding on you. It's not my faithfulness. It's not my steadfastness. It's not my righteousness. It's God's faithfulness. God have mercy. It's God's faithfulness. It's God's holiness. It's God's righteousness. It ain't about me. It's all about God. You just might run into God most any time and most any place and under most any circumstance. Don't you just love these fellers when they preach? They act like they live on the mountain all the time. I've counseled them and their wife. They don't live on the mountain all the time. I got a friend of mine, and I love him, but he lies. Because every time you see him, how's your church doing? Great, wonderful, top side. Liar, 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 your stinking pants is on fire. <laughs> you say, how do you believe he's lying? Because it's an independent, fundamental, premillennial Baptist church. And Nate, <laughs> only the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Southern Baptists are good all the time. Not us. Every time I see him, hey, look, great, top side, glory. I told my wife the other day, I said, I just wish one time, just one time, just one time to make me feel better. And I would say, how you doing if he would just say one time, rotten, rotten, rotten. When I was laying up there in that hospital, 
with the foot of my guts cut out, hooked up to all these machines, bags of fluid, and tripping out, having an allergic reaction to morphine. And I'm telling my wife, go get my gun, blow my brains out. I can't, hey, I wasn't wonderful. I wasn't on top side. And then the old devil, somebody always tells him what room you're in. And he don't care if it's double occupancy. He, that rascal knows what bed you're in. And then he goes to hell and gets some, some reinforcements and parades around your bed and says stuff like this. Shout now, big boy. Preach now, glory preacher. Have a spell now, Mr. Count Meeting. You've been blessing everybody else. Bless yourself. I'll stop you here. I, I'll stop you here. You won't shout after this. You won't preach after this. You're done. I got your number. And you'll lose your mind if you ain't careful. But wait a minute. Hadn't read one verse all day. Hadn't felt like praying all day. And if salvation would have been on feeling, I'd have been messed up. But uninvited. I said, but uninvited. Oh, God. Uninvited. Unexpected. Praise God and undeserving. He walks in. Leans over the bed and says, He's a liar. 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 Leans across the bed and says, Peace be still. That means in Hebrew, everything's going to be all right. Boy, I used to love it when my daddy would say, Boy, everything's going to be all right. I like it when my mama said, Honey, honey, everything's going to be all right. Now, I can't get my wife to say it. When I get in the fix, she just says, Ah, oh, suck it up, bless God, be a man. Yeah. You feel my pain, don't you, Wish on? Let me tell you young girls something. He wants sympathy. He wants sympathy. When he comes in discouraged, he don't want to hear you say, Ah, bless God, suck it up, be a man. He wants to hear you say, Oh, baby, you're the best. You're the greatest. You're wonderful. I know he can forget it. My wife was trying to encourage me the other day, and she said this. She said, baby, I don't care if you ever win another race. You're still my horse. <laughs> Woo! How many of you remember hearing your mama say, it's going to be all right? Your daddy's saying, it's going to be all right. And one time in 60 years, it's going to be all right. And I've had my friends say it. I've had my church members say it. Oh, I've had my kids say it. Oh, but I'm going to tell you something. I really do like to hear it. I said, I really do like to hear it. I said, I really do like to hear it. When the sweet Lord of glory leans over and says, it's going to be all right. Gonna be all right. Hey, you know why that means a lot to me? Cause he can make it all right. Cause he is all right. I'm telling you, brother, he can take your gloom and turn it to gladness when he speaks peace to your soul. Thirdly, Thomas wasn't in church that Sunday. He was fishing. God will forgive you for that. He was hunting. God might forgive you for that. If you miss church play golf, you're damned forever. No forgiveness in this world 
or the world to come. Son, there's a woman back there. If she hits her husband one more time, that dude's going to need 911. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> Thomas wasn't even there. Them old timers used to say this. The very service you miss, you're going to miss something for your life. Remember now, you preachers are going to love this. Remember I told you, Mary stayed late. Thomas didn't even come at all. So the moral of the story is when it comes to going to church, go often and stay late. But as Paul Harvey says, page 2, here's the rest of the story. Next Sunday, three Sundays in a row, God shows up for church. And He's the God of second opportunity. He ain't going to go back to heaven and leave old Thomas over there just to wonder it. Hey, as far as God was concerned, Jesus could have ascended right after His resurrection. But He stayed behind on purpose. Forty days, the number of trials, to dry a little girl's tears, to calm the disciples' fear. And He had one more stray out yonder, hold out in Thomas. And Jesus said, I ain't going back till I get them all straightened out. Hallelujah. And on that Sunday morning again, Jesus came. And this time, this time, Thomas was there. He walked in, for Thomas had said the Sunday before, I'll not believe it. Have you ever tried to tell somebody who wasn't at church what kind of service they, boy, you ought to have been there. Boy, the choir, the preacher, the move of God. You ought and finally, you just said, you just ought to have been there. And they're going, can't be that good, can't be that good, can't be that good. And Thomas is saying, I'll not believe a word of it, I'll not believe a word of it until I take my hands and run it into here. I'll not believe a word of it. Oh, but he loves Thomas. Thomas has been unfaithful. Thomas sat and prayed and read his Bible. He don't deserve a thing, but God loves him. Well, I don't know why I'm preaching so strong on that tonight, but I believe the Holy Ghost just spoke to my heart. There's a child of God in this place, and all day long today the devil has run his accusing thing in your face and said, you're low down, and you're sorry, and you're undeserving, and you don't deserve a thing. Look at him right now and say, bless God, you're all right. But I serve a wonderful Savior, and I serve a wonderful God. Hey, failure is not final with God. He's the God who comes back next Sunday. And all he does again, walk in. He says, Thomas, look over here a minute. Woo! That's all it took. And Thomas did what he said he'd never do. Believed. And said, my Lord and my God. Time out. If you ain't never shouted in church before, right here's a good place for your initial spell. I love what Jesus said in verse 29. Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. And then he used that slap happy word. But blessed, happy, enthralled, tickle pink, blessed are those. Blessed are those who have not seen. Happy are those. Blessed are those that have... Lord God, that's us. That's us. I said, that's us. I said, that's us. Lord God Almighty, that's us. That's us. That's us. We're happy. 
what we've not seen, yet we believe a special blessing. I've never seen it, but I still believe, and that's why I'm happy. Hey, I got a glimpse of him a time or two. I said, I've got a glimpse of him a time or two. I've seen him glow on the preacher man when he preaches. I've seen him bubble up in some saint as they shouted the glory down. And it was just a little glimpse. I've had him pass by my altar of prayer like a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. I've been hidden to the cliff of the rock even when the glory came by and got a little blip. But it was just a glimpse. It was just a blip. I have not seen him face to face. Well, I'm still happy. I'm still blessed. Somebody ought to holler hallelujah right there. Amen. Amen. Because he put a special blessing on those. He said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. He said, but there's coming a generation. They've not seen me. But yet, let me ask you something. How many of you, you believe him tonight? You believe tonight. You are a believer tonight. You believe his mercy. You believe his word. You believe his grace. You believe his book. I'm a believer. I believe. And I'm happy. I've never seen him. But praise God, I will. And he takes the gloom and turns it to gladness. Stone was rolled away. The saints were comforted. Last I'm done. Back up in our text. John chapter 20, verse 8. Actually, verse 6, 7, and 8. The sign was given. And when the sign was given, it turned their gloom into gladness. You say, what in the world do you mean about a sign given? As my brother said and lied about it, give me five more minutes. (laughs) I love you. Bless God, that's the longest five minutes I've ever seen in my life. I'm glad you asked. All right. You two boys help me. You help the black man, you're going to help the white man. Equal opportunity employer. The Bible said Peter and John ran down to the tomb. One stayed out, one went in. That one that went in saw verse 6, 7, and 8. It said, it saw the linen clothes, swaddling clothes, what they had wrapped him up in in the external bombing of that day was laying there where the body was. But the King James Bible, which is the inspired, preserved Word of God, which is the inspired and preserved Word of God. Final answer. It ain't deal or no deal. That's God's deal. Deal it or not. Said, the linen clothes were lying, but the napkin that was over his face was wrapped together neatly in a place by itself. What does that mean? I'm so glad you asked. Three minutes. In that Eastern culture of that day, if a king was dining at his table and he was finished, he was done, It was over, and he wasn't going to come back. He would wipe his mouth, ball up his napkin, and flippantly toss it anywhere on the table. So when that servant came by and saw that old napkin balled up, flippantly tossed upon the table, it said, he's finished, 
He's done. It's over. Clean her up. That's it. But it also says that during that meal, if he was summoned to the throne for some official business, Can I say that again? If he got summons to the throne for some official business and he wasn't finished and it wasn't over and he wasn't done and he was coming back and when he got back he's going to pick up where he left off he would neatly Fold the napkin and lay it wrapped together at the head of the table. So when that servant came by, it say, don't move a thing. Hang around the premises. It ain't over. He'll be back. And when he gets back, he's going to pick up where he left off. Come on now, boys. They run down to the tomb. One stops, one runs in and sees that folded napkin. And he runs out and says, it ain't over. It ain't over. He's not finished. He's coming back. And when he gets back, he's going to pick up where he left off. I want to tell you what a turn. Your gloom and the gladness. When you realize... It ain't over. It's not done. He's coming back. And when he gets back, he's going to pick up where he left off. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. He's coming back. And take your gloom and turn it into gladness. Well, I'm done. Y'all can sit down now. How many of you got lost loved ones in your family? How many of you got some people in your family? They think you are a crackpot. They wanted you to get just enough religion so you'd quit embarrassing the family. But bless God, you done got too much now. And they wanted you to get in church. But one like this was really not what they had in mind. And so now when they see you, they say stuff like this. There he goes. Old Bible thumper. Old Jesus fan. Holy roller. There he goes. You got neighbors that watch you every Sunday morning and they say, There they go. Going to church again. They really think there's something. There they go. Down at the school, down at the work. There they go. Look. There they go. Yeah. Yeah. You make me want to preach like a brother. Hey. One of these days, Jesus is going to come back and we're going to leave out of here and they're really going to say, there they go. There they go. But praise God, there will be a crowd on the other side of saying, here they come, here they come, here they come. I'm just here to tell you, the best is yet to come. And God will take your gloom and turn it into gladness. When He passes by and reminds you that He's God, and besides Him, there is none else. Our Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the liberty and the freedom to proclaim it. Father, I know we got a crowd of people here tonight. 
that touches my heart. He said, a house of God fool. God, somebody still loves old-time religion. And we love you for that. But God, even though we got a host of people here, there's no one that's got lost in this crowd. You know every individual heart. You know every individual need. Now, some little preacher said here tonight, God feels like nobody cares. God, may you come to their weeping place tonight and take their gloom and turn it to gladness. Lord, there's a little mama here tonight, dad here tonight. God, there may be some teenager here tonight, God, that feels like the world is at an end and nobody cares. God, move in their life. Take their gloom. Turn it to gladness. Meet their need. God, would you do for us in this place what we cannot do for ourselves? And we'll give you maximum praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.